friends, remember a couple of months ago when I said this? I am slightly curious as to just how the different amount of uh, ribbing. Well, nothing beats a scientist like a side project to distract from the main project, so I did it. And I thought I'll show you how we do our experiments here, because why not? First thing any self-respecting scientists do is to state our goal or hypothesis. Like in this experiment, in which our goal is to determine the effect of the number of rows and stitches in the spiral pattern on both the shear and stretch deformation of the fabric. Long? Yeah. Needlessly complicated? Mm, not really. What's the next step, you ask? Why it's determining our variables. And now you might ask again, what is variables? Variables are things that can exist in different ways. That's basically anything you can mess around with. There are usually three different kinds of variables, independent, dependent, and control. Independent variables are things that we change, like the number of rows and stitches in the spiral pattern. Dependent variables, on the other hand, are things that get changed, like the stretch and shear deformation of our fabric. See why we do our long purpose statement now? The last variables, controlled variables, are things that we're keeping the same. This sometimes confuses people and it honestly confuses me poo when I first learned it. Because how can things be the same, really? But this is a very, very important part of experiments. See, I'm trying to see if one type of stitch has more stretch than the other. Uh, say we're using the, this uh, size 3 needle to do the first stitch and this size 8 needle, size eight needle to do the other stitch. Uh, do you think this is a fair comparison? Would the second stitch be more stretchy because we use a larger needle or because of the actual inherent properties of the stitch itself? Sometimes it's also very hard to keep our control variables control. Like for now, I'm trying to make sure that all my swatches are knitted the exact same way with the same needles and the same yarn. But of course I'm human and I cannot maintain constant tension throughout the entire process. Then after we have determined our variables, we can get out the sample prep. Favorite part. I needed 18 rows in the round, 24 stitches in each row, and I did one fully stuck in a swatch just for our baseline measurements, and then I needed 9 different spiral conditions. The first 5 are ones where I vary the amount of knits before I switch to purl, and the width of the spiral, so to speak, but I keep the amount of rows before I move over one stitch the same, that is 3 rows. I do this because for every single experiment we want to just change one variable at a time. Then of course we have to change the number of rows, but keeping the amount of stitches the same. All in all, it took me a couple of hours to make all the swatches, which is partly because I haven't done it in quite a long time. But I have spent far longer on other sample preps, so this is actually quite fast, all things considered. Then after we have all of our swatches done, it's time to stretch them. I just made a homemade measuring table by taping my measuring tape to my table. And to help me distribute the force equally on the swatch, I just used two pencils that I stuck inside the swatch. It's pretty fun pulling the switches away. I did my measurements three times for each swatch because then we can take the average of it and hopefully get a more accurate result. We can talk more later about sources of error, but let me just tell you there are a lot of sources of error in this experiment. Not the least because I've knitted the swatches by hand, but it should be accurate enough to get us a trend. Then we just pull the swatches again, this time vertically. I can't use the pencils here to help me distribute the force, so I just hold it down with my fingers. It seemed to work. And finally, we get to the most funnest, most interesting, or at least for me, part. Testing out how the difference in rows and columns in a spiral stitch affects its ability to be twisted around. This is what makes our spiral socks different than our regular socks, so I'm excited to see the results. I made this also very homemade rotation angle measure by taping my tape measure to the sides of my water bottle. This water bottle has the perfect radius in that our swatches are nice and snug there, but not too tight as to not let them stretch even more. Then I just hold one part of the swatch down and twist the other part around until I can't twist them anymore. I took the length between where the stitch began and where it stopped moving and divided it by the circumference of our water bottle to get ourselves the amount of how much our spiral is thorough twisting in the units of angular displacement, that is, radians. Then we're finished with all of our experiments. Or are we? We're finished with the data collecting part of our experiments, but we still need to process our data and determine what insight we can get of it. I then spent quite a bit of time in front of the computer, taking averages and propagating errors. Then I also put the data into Python because I've forgotten how to do this. 
any other way and this is what I use every day to see how we can best model the influence of the number of rows and columns and all of this. It's a long and hefty process and it involves me trying to be fancy and using curvefit, a function inside Python that fits your data to an equation. But it failed spectacularly and I just did end up modeling them by hand. If you do want to see this process of curve fitting and what a mess that is, shoot me a comment. Surprisingly, or perhaps not, increasing the amount of the rows and columns increases its horizontal and vertical stretch. Though this should be taken with a grain of salt because of so many errors involved here. What is interesting though is that there is an optimal number of rows and columns on the spiral pattern to give it the best tolerance for shear deformation, aka twisting. You can see from the data points that we have a peak at rows equals 3. More than that, we see that there is an increase from rows equals 1 to rows equals 3, and then a decrease from rows equals 3 to rows equals 6, which leads us to conclude that 3 is the optimal number of rows to let the socks tolerate twisting for this particular yarn, needle, and my needling. The same thing happens on the number of columns. 3, as you can see, is also the optimal one in this case. You can make a generalization and say that 2 to 4 is what is optimal, depending on your own case, and that does show in the literature, aka all of the other patterns. You do have quite a bit of change between one pattern to another, but they all generally keep to within 2 to 4 rows of rows and columns for the spiral pattern. For me, at least, this shows that the spiral sox's ability to twist itself into the shape that we want is what is desired by all of these patterns, and that to do that, we need to keep our patterns between two to four rows and columns. And that, my friend, is my conclusion. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up so that I know you want me to do more of these, and maybe check out my other Bell Talks About Science in the Middle of Crafting videos. See you all next time! Bye!